Economic institutions were also highly extractive. Political institutions were extracted, but so were economic institutions. Apartheid was a system which was organized for exploiting black people for the benefit of white people. Okay? That's an extractive economy. Black people had few incentives, white people had great incentives, and they lived at developed country living standards as a consequence of the impoverishment of black people. So what happened in 1994 in South Africa when apartheid collapsed? South Africa moved from much more extractive to much more inclusive political institutions. Okay? South Africa democratized black people, had political power for the first time. Nelson Mandela became president. Okay? Then what happens? Well, once you move towards more inclusive political institutions, the extractive economic institutions of apartheid had to crumble. So economic institutions moved in the direction of being more inclusive. The interesting thing talking about Zimbabwe in some sense is that in 1980 Zimbabwe followed exactly the same path of becoming much more inclusive politically Black people were also enfranchised for the first time in Zimbabwe in 1980. But the problem in Zimbabwe is that that process went into the reverse. Okay? So when you read the book, you'll see a lot of the discussion is about often societies can move in a good direction, but you have to consolidate that move. And I think South Africa, there's a lot of challenges in South Africa, if you know what's going on in South Africa at the moment, but in South Africa, they've done a much better job at consolidating inclusion, consolidating inclusive economic institutions by using very aggressive policies such as black economic empowerment to try to radically change the inclusiveness of the economy. In Zimbabwe, the system never went in that direction. Okay, so 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 I mean, I can ha I'm happy to talk more about that. Okay, let me say one more thing with this diagram, which is China. I'm going to talk about China in a second, which is, what about China? Everyone's obsessed with China. Maybe you're not so obsessed in China, uh, in Somaliland, as many other countries. But mostly when I go and talk about this book, people say, what about China? So here's what happened in China in the late 1970s. When Deng Xiaoping was premier, what did Deng Xiaoping do? Deng Xiaoping moved economic institutions in a far more inclusive direction. He, dis he started in 1978 dismantling kind of socialist organization of agriculture, abolishing communal agriculture, creating incentives, the whole uh, so-called household responsibility system where people could decide what to plant, what to do. It led to an enormous increase in uh, incentives and agricultural productivity that spread into the industrial economy in the 1980s. Okay, so so China moved from much more extractive to much more inclusive inst economic institutions, but it stayed with extractive political institutions. So the Communist Party is still in charge in China. So what uh, what do we say about that? What does the theory say about that? It says. You, you can't have an inclusive economy with extractive political institutions. Okay? So, so and here's, you know, here's my example of that. I'm going to cut to this. Okay. So, so and, you know, it's a, this is, a, you know, a, here's, here's the way I think about this. You might think this is simplistic. You might think this is simplistic. And you might think it's also, also culturally specific, which I'm happy to talk about which is power tends to corrupt, absolute power corrupts absolutely. So what you see in China at the moment is the creation of a personalistic dictatorship. And what, I think if you look at the history of China, you know that this only gets abused at the expense of the economy. Okay? So, so, so concentrated political power in the hands of the Communist Party, in my view, in the, in the, uh, this is a prediction of the theory, is not consistent with having a sustained inclusive economy. So China does not have, political, uh, does not have political institutions which are consistent with it becoming uh, uh, a really developed nation.
Okay? So, you know, many people say, oh, this time it's different. You know, when you say that in the United States, people like to say, oh, but, you know, this time it's different. You know, Chinese are different. Chinese, like, there's cultural differences. You know, the usual argument is merit. Chinese people respect merit. So if you're successful in China, you'll be, you'll be left alone by the Communist Party because Chinese people respect merit. And whenever I hear that, I think about Jack Ma. You know, he is one of the most, he's a little eccentric, you can see. He's one of the most successful Chinese business people over the last few decades. Uh, the, the starter of Alibaba. Uh, he likes to play the guitar as well, you can see. You know, what happened with Jack Ma? Jack Ma criticized the government's regulation of, uh, uh, of his industry. He disappeared for three months. Nobody saw him. And in fact, nobody's really seen him since, ever since. He's become obliterated. You know, if you ever read George Orwell's book, uh, 1984, you know, in George, you know, the Winston Smith, the main character in 1984, his job was to erase people from photographs. You know, like Stalin. As Stalin murdered the members of the Bolshevik Central Committee, he would airbrush them. We have more sophisticated technology for doing this nowadays. He would get them out of the, the photographs and pretend they didn't exist. Okay? And that's what happens with business people who criticize the Communist Party. So you can't, you can't run a modern economy like this with totalitarianism. It's just not possible. Okay. So, 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 so of course, that diagram was meant to show that, that you know, uh, things can often reinforce themselves. And in a society with extractive institutions, they tend to reproduce themselves, you know, in the same way that societies with inclusive institutions tend to reproduce themselves. But a lot of the book is also about transitions. You know, I talked a little bit about South Africa. But my own country, Britain, for example, you know, Historically, Britain might have relatively inclusive institutions today, but historically, of course, Britain didn't have inclusive institutions. It had extractive political and extractive economic institutions. So Britain had to create those institutions. It had to create an effective central state. It had to create broad-based political power. It had to democratize. It had to create more inclusive economic institutions. So we talk a lot about this process of breaking the mold. You know, there's great examples in Africa since independence. Botswana is one which I did a lot of research in 20 years ago, which was, you know, I'm going to come to Somaliland briefly. Uh, but a lot of the book, you know, South Africa is a great example, the collapse of apartheid. Uh, and what we emphasize in the book, which I think is relevant for Somaliland, is how is it that you start to make a transition from extractive institutions to inclusive institutions. And the answer is, it's people who suffer under the extractive institutions who organize collectively, oops, I feel I'm going to fall over, who organize collectively to fight against them. How did Somaliland become independent and start to create a different sort of society? You fought against the dictatorship in Mogadishu. You struggled against it. How is it today, you know, in Khartoum, in the Sudan, people are trying to build a different type of society? They struggled in the streets against President al-Bashir and now against the military. Okay, so think of those examples. Think of the Arab Spring. Okay, so that's the model really, that's the theory we developed about how you make a transition from extractive to inclusive institutions. Those examples, of course, show that's difficult to do. The Arab Spring shows that it's very difficult. Or think about what's going on in Sudan now. It's very hard to make a transition in society. Why? Because many people have a vested interest in the extractive institutions. The military in Sudan have a vested interest in the extractive institutions and they don't want to let go of power. They're happy living in a poor country where they see themselves doing well and they're not willing to embrace a different country or a different uh, Sudan in the same way that, you know, Siad Barre was not, was, was not willing to do the same here, okay? So, you know, this is, 
that I was in Cairo recently, and President Sisi, you know, here, this is the new dictator in Egypt. You know, he pictures himself with the pyramids, uh, so he has a serious problem with narcissism. Uh, he's the new pharaoh. Okay, so, so let me, I'm not going to talk about that. Let, 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 me, let, me, let me, I want to move to talking about Somaliland. I've been, I've been talking too long. I feel I should shut up soon. So let me move towards talking about, so I'm talking about the problem of building more inclusive institutions and how difficult that is, okay? And I think one of the things that brought Professor Heldring and I to Somaliland is this puzzle of how you build institutions, like how do you build state capacity, how do you build inclusive political institutions, how do you build inclusive economic institutions. And often people talk about Denmark, you know, there's this sort of cliche nowadays, if you go and talk at the World Bank, people at the World Bank say, you know, oh everyone, the problem is to be like Denmark, you know, like, w which I find completely ridiculous, you know, I mean it's a fine country Denmark, but there's very different cultures, histories, societies, and there's many, what we know from history is there's many different ways to create prosperity. The way Japan created prosperity or created an inclusive society was extremely different from the way that Britain did it or Sweden or the United States or indeed Botswana or other places that have been successful. So, so, so don't think about Denmark, think about yourselves and think about your own society. And one of the things we've been studying recently is the experience in Rwanda. So Rwanda is a society that's built very effective state institutions in the sense of being able to implement policy. Uh, but it doesn't look a bit like Denmark. And I don't mean because it's a sort of dictatorship, okay? It is a dictatorship, but I think what's more interesting for us is the economic successes and how that relates to the development of state institutions. I would say, you know, thinking about my discussion of China, you know, I would say, in Rwanda, they don't have a political model which is compatible with long-run economic development. But just like in China, they've delivered, they've generated a lot of prosperity in the last 30 or 40 years, okay? So, so, so let me think through this question of how state capacity might work differently because I think that's one of the things that intrigued Professor Heldren and I a lot coming to Somaliland where you know you have a society which is sociologically extremely different from a western society like Denmark you have these clan structures uh, which for you know a western social scientist you know western social scientists would say these clan structures would be inconsistent with building you know successful institutions but it turns out that Rwanda has clan structures too, and it has very dense social structures, very non-Western type of society, but that's been combined with policy implementation and institution building in a very successful and interesting way. You know, just to give you an example of, here's economic growth from the World Bank webpage in Rwanda since the genocide, of course, this is the traumatic period of the genocide in 1994, and there's been enormous improvement in economic in GDP per capita in Rwanda since that period. So this is really a, you know, a growth miracle. And lying behind that is the development of a very effective state. So uh, you know, this is data from the, um, the World Economic Forum, and you can see that according to this index, the, the state capacity of Rwanda is something like Greece, you know, or Colombia, you know, in Latin America. I do this to beat up on my Nigerian friends. You know, here's, here's Nigeria down there, you know, Nigeria doesn't have, uh, you know, I go, I work a lot in eastern Nigeria, if I go to my friend's village, the government does nothing. It's the local people provide everything. They provide the school, they provide the health clinic, they provide security, they, 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 they pave the roads. The government, the national government, even the state government does nothing, okay? So, so governance in Nigeria is very poor. But, but, but Rwanda has become like a, like, a, like, a, like a poorer member of the European community, okay? So how does, that do, how does it do that? Well, not through taxation, okay? If you look at tax revenue relative to national income, you know, there's, there's a lot of missing data. But Rwanda, you know, maybe it's about 14% of GDP per capita. So the International Monetary Fund says you can't have a proper state unless tax revenues are 15% of national income. So Rwanda has never reached that. So Rwanda has an enormous amount of capacity 
But it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not doing that through raising a lot of taxes. So how is it doing it? Okay. It's doing it by, tie, by tapping into the traditional organization of Rwandan society. If you look at the way the government is structured, this is, this is a bit complicated, but this is a sector, beneath that is a cellul, underneath that is a, my Kenya Rwanda is about as, about as bad as my Somali, so the Umudugudu, uh, and then there's a, I, can't, I won't even try to pronounce that. There are these layers of government, right down to the village, okay? So the Rwandan state has an amazing capacity to organize people, to get them collaborating, working collectively. But what's interesting about this is it doesn't cost any money, okay? Everybody here elected no salary, elected no salary, elected no salary, no salary, no salary. Some people have a salary, monthly salary, coordinator, no salary, no salary, no salary. One person has a salary, okay? At the higher level of the sector, people are paid. But most people in the Rwandan state who are implementing policy are, doing it un are being unpaid. So you don't need a lot of tax revenue to implement policy when the people who are working for the government don't get paid anything. Why are they, why are they prepared to work? Because this is based on very traditional structures of authority and cooperation and political legitimacy in society. And one of the interesting, most interesting you know, things that President Kagame did, for example. President Kagame is brilliant at using these traditional aspects of Rwandan society to implement policy. So, so uh, in, a few, in 2006, at a meeting of mayors in, Kig in, in Kigali, uh, they, were, they were making outrageous promises about the success they were going to have. And President Kagame says, ah, oh, making extravagant promises is not, not something you do in Rwanda unless you can deliver on that. And he evoked a traditional practice called imihigo, which was really a, a kind of traditional institution of reciprocity, of promising to do something, you know, in exchange for something else. And out of this notion of imihigo, he created an enormous administration uh, system for policy implementation. So if you look at the web page, he talks about as part of efforts to reconstruct Rwanda and nurture a shared national identity, the government of Rwanda drew on traditional practices in Rwandan culture to adapt its development programs to the country's needs and context. So President Kagame has been very brilliant, not by trying to make Rwanda look like Denmark, but using Rwandan culture and history and institutions to build capacity and implement policy and Imihigo is a big part of that, okay? And here he is in the, in the middle, in the middle uh, uh, I say it's a very non-Weberian state, I'm not going to talk about Weberian. Here he is, these are, these are, you know, these are people who have won prizes uh, for, 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 for service delivery. This is, a fa this is a big kind of event they have every year where they give out prizes you know, to people who have kind of done best in this process. So this is a fascinating example of a kind of building state capacity but in a very non-Western way. Okay? And I guess, I think, you know, what, what we got so interested in, uh, you know, in the case of Somaliland is, you know, how to think about the success of uh, Somaliland since its independence in 1991. I think if you were going to think about where Somaliland was on that diagram I showed you, you'd start by thinking about, okay, were its institutions uh, extractive, were its political institutions extractive or inclusive? Okay? And the two dimensions of that were state capacity, the effectiveness of the state, and the dist broad distribution of power. So the first thing I know about Somaliland society, at least historically from the 1950s, from reading Yon Lewis's A Pastoral Democracy, is that Somaliland was an intensively democratic society. He emphasizes a pastoral democracy. He emphasizes that decisions were made in an extremely uh, uh, participatory way amongst men, amongst men, it's all men, so that may be an issue. Uh, uh, but. But, but by world historical standards, it was an extremely democratic society. So there's a big basis for one of the dimensions of inclusive 
political institutions in this country. Somalia, Somaliland didn't need any Western people to teach them how to be democratic. They knew exactly how to do that. Okay? But, of course, it's also true, you know, this is part of Lewis's discussion, that Somaliland historically did not have something like a centralized state, didn't have centralized state institutions. It had some ways of resolving disputes and providing basic public goods, but it didn't have a centralized state. So since 1991, and this is what Professor Heldring and I have been so fascinated by, there's been exactly this construction of centralized state institutions based in this very specific kind of cultural uh, context to kind of go alongside this history of, of, of highly participatory uh, democratic institutions. Okay, so I just was looking at this on the web. Okay, and I guess what we are trying to think through here, what we'd love to talk about, is how has Somaliland built up this state capacity? And we've been talking to people since we got here about how exactly does the state work? And how does the state implement policy? And how is that connected to these traditional social institutions and social structure? I gave you this example from Rwanda, Imihigo, where President Kagame kind of took a traditional practice and he embedded it in the modern state and used it as a way of implementing policy. So, so far we haven't understood that that happens in Somaliland. It seems that doesn't happen in Somaliland. But I think how you reconcile the development of state institutions with these structures, these cultural traditions which are so powerful, that is a very fascinating topic and it seems sort of key to understanding the the success of our perspective, the success of Somaliland. Again, like Rwanda, I got this from the Ministry of Finance webpage, tax revenues relative to GDP are very low in Somaliland. Of course, I put on the slide, I didn't say it, but of course, unlike many developing countries, you're not wasting tax revenues on debt service. So, you know, most poor countries waste a lot of money paying interest payments to Western banks and, and donors. But, so, Somaliland's not doing that, but the state is very small in terms of revenues, okay? It seems to be achieving a lot with a very small revenue base. So, that's one of the puzzles we're interested in. And I guess just to go back to this diagram and say, where is Somaliland on this diagram? I think if I thought about Somaliland historically, you know, I would say, you know, you suffered under this period, long period, you know, tw over 20 years of dictatorship uh, under Siad Barre. You know, you had a long period of dictatorship, you know, from my own country of British colonial uh, uh, dictatorship. Uh, I don't know too much. I've been trying to read about the more historic institutions of Somaliland before it was colonized, but, but I, I'm not sure I really understand how those societies were, were organized, uh, uh, kind of. But I think, you know, if you read Lewis's book, you'd say, well, political institutions might have been very participatory, but they lacked kind of centralized authority. So political institutions were extractive, at least in that one dimension. Economic institutions, were they extractive or not? I think during colonialism and Siad Barre, for sure. Uh, and what Somaliland has been doing since 1991, in some sense, is moving on the, it's almost moving on the diagonal. It's not moving the way China did. It's not moving the way South Africa did. It's moving on the diagonal. It's building more inclusive uh, political institutions at the same time as it's been building more inclusive economic institutions. But I think, you know, just to end, what I, was gonna, what I was trying to suggest by talking about, you know, Sudan or the Arab Spring is what we also know is that, you know, successful movements towards more inclusive societies can go into, into reverse. So it's very important to understand the kind of challenges to inclusion that arise from the particular types of institutions that you've built and to try to think that through. So I, I'm going to shut up now. I think I've talked too long. Uh, but you get the idea. Do you get the idea? You get the idea. You get the idea. Okay. All right. Okay. Three simple questions. I am Shambhaka. My three simple questions. The first one is, what South Korean economy means if North Korea can threat South Korea's economy within a night? My second question is, why don't you give us examples from China 
which is militarily uh, powerful and economically powerful. Or why you don't give us examples from your own country or like countries like uh, USA? My third question is, you were talking about a man called uh, Chapman, and you said why he's uh, a bit. Uh, can I ask you a question? Why uh, children are saying this? What, what does a very different one from children are saying who is journalist? Thank you, sir. Really appreciate about the lecture. It was the right time for Somaliland to have this lecture and to understand about it. My name is Dr. Dawood. I'm the Dean of School of Postgraduate. I agree with you all, majority, the criteria for the inclusion of political institutes and inclusion of economic institutions. But when it comes for, for how and Somaliland can fulfill, in Somaliland, in my opinion, the two problems are there. Economic exclusion and the political exclusion. But you rightly said in the beginning, yes, political inclusion, Somaliland have started on. But in the middle, like Zimbabwe, now they are turning back. And I agree with you, institution is what is can can make both of them in economically and politically to to, to improve. But when it comes for Somaliland, the issue is is how these institutions can build. Because I rightly have read about a book from a psychology, Somalian psychologist. He said the problem of Somalia is the, is the system which they are taking out. Because he was saying there is a three civilization. They are in between a three civilizations. The Somali old civilization and the Islamic civilization and the Western civilization. Having all this and in between all this, it's a great thing in one side. But if you don't understand how you harmonize them, it's the problem. And now we are in the middle of all this. But you give us a very good example of Rwanda, how Rwanda is contextualizing and indigenizing. Can you give us elaborated in more how we Somaliland can reconcile these problems and overcome about the problems which we have? Because if this system continue, like you are now seeing, the crisis is starting. In, in the last hour, we have a problem. The other side is we started having problems. The peace which we have before is now shrinking. So how we can overcome that? Thank you very much. The second question, why is I'm from China? And you know, it's, um, Professor Robertson's home country of India, the United States. So perhaps you have to read the book. So, yeah, the book and read. There's lots of different examples in the book that you can learn from. And on your last question, why did you have the Czech Ma and not Julian the Song? Well, I think that the Czech Ma example is, is in the context of the Chinese example that Professor Robinson gave. So the idea is that the Chinese may be actually open minded towards successful businessmen and be therefore be less extractive than we think. They are. This is an example where they go after one of the most successful businessmen. So that's why the example is in the presentation. Yeah. yeah. I think. I, th I think the important difference between Ju I'm, a, I'm a fan of Julian Assange. I think Julian Assange did everybody a big favor. So, so I think you know, for me, like states. States always try to take over society. You know, it's in their DNA. They want to control. They don't like criticism. They, you know, it's a struggle between society and the state. So I think people like Julian Assange are very important in, you know, risking their own personal freedom to, 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 to show what the state is doing that we don't understand. So I'm a big fan of Julian Assange. I think the difference between the two is that there's the rule of law in the case of Julian Assange, and there's absolutely no rule of law in the case of Jack Ma. So, so, so that, that's, that's, that's not a subtle difference, that's a very important difference. I don't agree at all with what will happen to Julian Assange, like personally, but what will happen to him will be decided by the law, and he broke the law. Jack Ma just pissed off some powerful communist who decided to, the guy is going to disappear. So, so I do think that's critical, but your question is very good. I think, you know, so that's a great question. I'm not a, you know, I mean, 
like, here's an example, you know, maybe you'll disagree with it, of a society that faces the same challenges. Think about the Emirates, you know, the United Arab Emirates, they have these traditional social structures, you know, they still have, they have these tribes, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, for me, one of the reasons why these, you know, Dubai or Abu Dhabi works well is that the traditional system brings a lot of legitimacy and stability to the society. You know, Sheikh Maktoum, he's a, you know, he's a brilliant man, but he's also the legitimate Sheikh of Dubai, you know. So, but they have Islam and they have all this Western pressure also, you know, Western consumerism, Western culture, but they seem to be doing a fantastic job of reconciling those, those things. I think in these East Asian cases, you, you see the same thing. You know, Japan has you know, this very traditional culture. Of course, you don't have Islam, but they had to reconcile this with Western culture, Western values that maybe they don't agree with. You know, and they have to find a balance. So, so I think, I don't, I don't know enough about Dubai to understand how they've done that, but it seems like they had the same challenges that you described here, no? I mean, so there's something to be learned maybe from that example. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor James, uh, for, uh, for coming to Amun University all the way from the USA. I think the time is uh, very short, and a uh, uh, lot of things are waiting us, so I would, uh, would like to close the session. And uh, we will go to uh, lunch together. Okay, perfect. So I know I've been a very, 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 very,